Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, today is just kind of what I would call a standalone sermon. Uh, the reason why this is going to be more of a standalone sermon is I'm not going to begin a new sermon series because I'm going to be gone uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this uh, this next Sunday uh, I will be gone because I'm going to be down in Mexico. Uh, our church group leaves on Wednesday, and uh, I would ask, and I'm going to ask at the end of the service that you continue to pray for uh, the group of folks that are going to be headed down uh, to Mexico. There's 18 of us in all. Um, many are, are, are actually going to be coming to Kansas City so that we can all uh, leave together. Um, and so uh, that's one thing. And then as many of you know as well, um, a, a while ago um, the Navy accepted me as a candidate and did the chaplain candidacy program. And so um, actually I'm home for a little less than 24 hours from Mexico and then I leave to go up to Rhode Island uh, to report for my initial two weeks of duty um, up there uh, learning about what it is to be a Navy chaplain. And so I'm going to be gone for a little while, um, but we do have some good folks that are scheduled to, uh, to preach here. Uh, we've got a couple of our elders and another guy named Chris Kalewski is a, a member of our church and he's going to be preaching as well. So many of you are probably relieved because you get a relief from me for three weeks. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but I'll be back and uh, things will return back to, to normal. Um, but before I leave, and, and I'm just thinking about all these things that, that I've got coming up on my schedule, and that's probably the reason why I think the Lord's kind of laid this message on to my heart. So I understand that, that this message is, is just as much to me as it is to, to you all. Uh, we're sharing this together. But this idea of what it is to be uh, the hands and the feet of Christ. Well, what does that look like? And we're, we're busy people. All of us are busy people. All of us have our own schedules. But, but what does that mean for us to, to be the very hands and the very feet of Christ that I believe all of us who are Christians are, are called to be? And there's a lot that we can learn from one another. Just by examining even something as, as simple as, as a practice in, in which we in our American society engage in in a regular basis. It's a practice that I'm sure that, that, that we even set a special time aside to do, even in our service. The practice I'm talking about is handshaking. What can we learn from shaking one another's hands? I, I was reading an article by a, a couple named Alan and Barbara Peace, and this is what they said. They said, in Western society, someone who steps forward and offers a handshake Holding it about a foot, a foot and a half, this person was or is a city dweller. Now if they stand with their feet planted and they only lean forward with their arm outstretched, well then they've probably been raised in a rural area where they're used to having a greater amount of personal space. Now a person who grew up in a very remote area, which in this day and age is very unlikely, but it can happen, they may prefer not to shake hands at all but they keep a greater distance from you and just wave. So maybe if you find here on Sunday morning, if you extend your hand and someone just waves at you, you know that maybe they really grew up up in the sticks, right? And then, of course, and then of course, these are just little deductions that we can make. Of course, I think many of us could probably recognize and see these types of things. But I, I was watching a TV show not too long ago. It was The Great Sherlock Holmes. Now, there you go. It's the master of being able to detect things by simple gesture such as a handshake. In this particular episode, what is happening is, is that Sherlock Holmes uh, shakes hands with an unsuspecting woman. The woman spends about five minutes in his presence and then leaves the room. And then the great Sherlock Holmes, he turns immediately to Watson and begins to tell what the visitor does for a living, her family status, income level, hobbies, and all of this was based upon shaking her hands. Now, of course, we're not the great Sherlock Holmes. We'll never measure to that capability uh, of uh, deductive reasoning. But even if we don't have those powers, right, there's a lot that we can learn from each other's hands, from each other's handshaking uh, abilities, right? Based upon uh, the way that uh, someone shakes your hand, there, there's things that you can tell. We can somewhat gauge the, their degree of strength, right? There are some people who, whenever I shake their hand, they're like, it's like shaking hands with a vice, 
you know, that they're crushing my hand, right? Because other people that you shake hands with, it's very, you know, very gentle, right? It's almost kind of like you're shaking a feather or something like that. And then there's another thing that we can tell is by their health, right? How healthy is a person gauged upon maybe just feeling their hand? Sometimes we can tell if the person is in good health, maybe they're, they're ailing, and so therefore, uh, maybe we can feel a little of the bone in their hands and whatnot, or arthritis that might have set in. Another thing that we can tell is, is possibly even the form of work that they do, right? So if this is a person who, who works with their hands, is a, is a, this is a person who, who who's a, knows how to use their hands and, and does things with them, um, we can feel those calluses on their hands. But then, you know, you shake hands with me, which is like baby soft, you know, and I'm just a, I'm just a wimp who sticks behind a computer all day long, right? You see, there's, a, there's something biblical about this examination of hands. And there was a gesture that Christ offered to his disciples. It was in the post-resurrection. This is after Jesus had been crucified. This is after the three days in, in the tomb. He was gloriously resurrected. Remember, we even talked about this whenever I preached that sermon about the ascension. That, that for 40 days, Christ was here on this earth. Now, there's only glimpses. There's only small pictures that we get of what Christ did in this post-resurrection state. But Luke gives us an account of one of them. It's at the very end of Luke's Gospel, and it takes place in Luke chapter 24. And it was actually in this place, in this setting, that Jesus extends his hands and offers the disciples to look at his feet. And I think that there was a purpose for this. But there was a reason why Jesus offered this to his disciples. And then ultimately, I believe that Jesus extends the same invitation through the expanse of time to you and I. Let's read Luke chapter 24, verses 36 and 40 together. If you would please stand as we read the gospel. Now while they were still talking about this, this is speaking about the disciples, Jesus himself stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they had saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bone, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. You may be seated. Now, there are some that would come to this text, and they would look at it very pragmatically, and they would say, well, all that Jesus was doing here is he's merely expelling any false idea that they may have amongst themselves, thinking that, that Jesus had not physically or bodily raised again. Now, of course, there's a part of that here. Of course, there's an element of truth within that, and that's very significant, as we know, to the Christian doctrine and to the Christian very core of our belief. That Jesus is not just spiritually raised, but rather that Jesus was physically raised from the dead through the power of the resurrection. That's something that's core to the Christian idea. Now, of course, we know that there are those who stand outside of Christianity and they poke and they prod and they try to dispel our belief in the physical bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But I think that there's something more than mere pragmatism whenever we examine this text. I believe that there's a theological implication here as well. Remember who he is talking to. These are the 11 disciples in whom he has spent a great deal of time with. These are the ones in whom he has poured his very heart and soul into. These are the ones who shared the most intimate moments with Christ at the beginning of his ministry all the way until that night in which he sweat blood because of the agony, agony and despair that he felt as he was taken and led into that place in which he eventually would lead to Golgotha, the cross. You see, I believe that Jesus welcomes those that he was so close to. His friends, if you will, 
He welcomes them to examine him so that they will do more than just examine. But they will also remember. But they will remember what it is that these hands have done and where these feet had gone. Why was this remembrance so important? You see, so often times when we gather, we talk about remembrance, especially here in our church. Why is that? Because we make it a practice every Sunday that we partake of the Lord's Supper. And in that practice, we are called to remember. And we even have it written on the table behind me, our communion table. Do this in remembrance of me. And so oftentimes as we, as we partake and we, we remember, this is all done in our head. This is done in our cognitive abilities. And there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, we are called to remember. We are called to think. We are called to recall. But you see, I think that in this gesture of Christ, there's something more that Jesus is calling his disciples to. He's saying that not only are you called to cognitively remember, but remembrance is also done actively. It is done in participation. It is not something that is only thought about but it is something that is physically done. You see, that is the life of the Christian. The life of the Christian isn't to just sit back and, and consider enlightenment. The life of the Christian is, is not one whom is called to, to merely come into a room like this and just cognitively <laughs> consider what it is that Christ has done. The life of the Christian is to participate in Christ himself. Thus, we are the hands and the feet of Christ. That our remembrance is done not only in our mind, but our remembrance is done in what it is that we are doing, what it is that we are participating in. Maybe you'll recall with me one of the most difficult teachings of Christ, yet one of the best teachings, I feel, is whatever he said, whatever you do, by the least of these, you have done for me. Jesus is saying, whatever you have thought about the least of these, whatever you have considered for the least of these, and if you have maybe even envisioned a cup of cold water going into their hand, whatever that is, then that's a good thing. No, he said, whatever you have done for the least of these, thus you have done for me. We have left the realm of merely cognitively or celebrally thinking about things, but rather we are called to participate in what it is that Christ is doing. And so it is as we remember. We remember as those disciples remembered. You see, Jesus invites this examination so that they might gaze at his hands and his feet and remember where they had been and what they had done. I believe that they looked at those hands and they saw those hands that had broken bread for them a hundred times before. And in the Jewish manner and method, lifted hands to his Father in heaven and called a blessing upon what it is that they were about to partake in. I believe that as those disciples looked at those hands, they saw those hands that reached down and dipped mud out of the ground and patted it upon the eyes of that blind man. And then he was miraculously healed. I believe that as they looked at those hands, they saw those hands that reached out and touched the cold, lifeless body of that little girl. And then he called her from her slumber and raised her and she held his hand and she walked again. Those hands that as most speakers do move through the air in his particular gestures and the way in which he communicated as they sat there and they watched him deliver that sermon on the mountain in which he changed our entire perspective of who God is and how it is that we worship Him. 
those are the same hands that reached out and touched that leopard upon that busy street when no one else would. And then their gaze dropped and they looked at those feet. Those were the feet that they had followed for hundreds of miles throughout that landscape. Those were the feet that took the good news wherever it was that they traveled. Those were the feet that found themselves in some curious places, the homes of Pharisees and corrupt bureaucrats. Those were the feet that so easily traveled to those that were scorned and outcast by society, whom Jesus treated with love and compassion. Now looking at those feet, I believe that those disciples remembered a common woman. A woman who came in and interrupted a dinner and wet them with her tears and then dried them with her hair. Those were feet, I believe the disciples remembered that that adulterous woman was laid at. And then those religious leaders trying to track Jesus said, what do we do with this woman? And that woman, so scared, so frightened, couldn't look up and face her accusers. All she could do was look at those feet as she began to hear the thuds of rocks hitting the ground. For no one was willing to pick up the throne, the stones and throw first. Those were the feet that protected her. As they looked at those hands, as they looked at those feet, they were wounded. They had holes in them. They were terribly bruised. I believe it is the kind of wounds that if we were to look at, we would wince at in pain. Because we sympathize with how terribly he was hurt. But yet, they needed to look. They had to look. And we must look as well. We are called to remember, my friends. And we are called to act in our remembrance. You see, Jesus has spoken to us through the expanse of times. And he offers his hands. And he offers his feet. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. You see, we are called to remember those of you who call yourself Christians. You are called to remember that you surrendered your own hands and your own feet in your confession of making the Lord your Lord and Savior. In the waters of baptism, you surrendered your hands, your feet, the hands that would bring you material wealth, the hands that would seek to serve what it is that you desire to do, the feet that will carry you to the places that you want to go, and the feet that will take you to the pleasures and the things that it is that you want to gratify yourself with. Christian, remember, you surrendered those hands. You surrendered those feet. You said, I'll take your hands. Your feet, oh Lord. I surrender my will, that your will will be done through me. You have become a part of something far greater than yourself. You participate in the very body of Christ. A body that has existed for 2,000 years. A body that will continue to exist until it is that Christ comes back. And then, and then you, O oh faithful Christian, <coughs> those of you who have surrendered your hands and your feet, well, then you will enjoy glory for all eternity. You see, my friends, I do not believe that being the hands and the feet of Jesus is a discretionary option for the Christian. 
for being the hands and the feet of Christ are the very directive of the Christian faith. It's not something that you get to opt in or opt out of. It's assumed. Maybe this is the reason why Christ extends His hands and His feet for your examination. Look and remember. Look and see. And then do as I have done. We belong to Christ. And it is His will that we seek to do. Of course, many observations could be made concerning these hands on these feet. And these are only my observations. But I believe that one thing that I see as I look and I peer into the hands of Christ is I see that they were an inviting hands. That these were hands that welcomed all to come and join Him. Now, of course, we know that there were those that refused this invitation. It wasn't because they weren't welcome. It was because they couldn't handle the teaching that came with the following. They couldn't handle the truth that Christ so easily gave to all. But let us not forget that although Christ spoke truth, He spoke it in love. But there were those like that rich young ruler and He could not give up His hands. Hands that would bring him material wealth. Hands that would bring him gratification in life. Feet that would take him where he pleased to go and do the bidding that he desired to do. He could not give those up. And so we read in the Gospels that he walked away. A man who claimed to have kept the law perfectly walked away from Christ. Because those feet he could not follow and those hands he could not emulate. With those hands, Jesus feasted with the marginalized. With those hands, Jesus restored broken lives. With those hands, he challenged the corruption and the hypocrisy of religious authority. With those very hands, he undermined the pillars of an empire with such a gentle force. Sculpting with those precious hands a new kingdom where the last shall be first. And those that serve, well, those will be known as the greatest. Now those were inviting hands. Now, there were those that were invited. They could not participate because they couldn't handle the truth of what it is that Christ so easily portrayed. We might ask the question, well then what are the hands of Jesus? I believe that one thing the hands of Jesus are is they are working hands. <clears throat> Jesus got his hands dirty. He was not one of those religious leaders who stood in the comforts of the temple and spoke about all of the knowledge in which he had gathered. But rather, Jesus was out with the people, doing what it is that the people did. Jesus knew what it was to pick up a hammer and a chisel. Jesus knew what it was to gather the crops. Jesus knew what it was to throw and mend the nets in the lakes. Jesus had working hands. My friends, we are called to have working hands. <clears throat> you see, not only did Christ know what it was to labor manually, but He knew what it was to labor spiritually as well. And sometimes we forget that our hands are called to work as well. Our hands are not to remain unclean, or to remain clean. Our hands are not to remain distant from the masses, but rather we must follow where Christ's hands have been. And we must be willing to allow our hands to be dirty in the muddy pools of ministry. You see, 
the hands of Christ were also wounded. And we, my friends, will experience wounding as well. I'm not saying that you're going to go to the cross, but that would serve no greater purpose. However, your hands will be wounded as you follow the example of Christ. Your hands will feel the tinge and the ting of being rejected, sometimes even being scorned. Your hands will know what it is to hurt after laboring all day and then not even being recognized for all the work that you've done. Having invested yourself in someone else's life and then have them only reject you whenever they probably need you the most. You see, my friends, we have working hands. And in the work of ministry, we will experience what it is to have wounded hands. But that's okay. Because we serve a Savior who has wonderful hands. And we must not forget that. We must not forget that His hands are far greater than our own. That when we've invested ourselves and we have no more to give, whenever we find ourselves at our wit's end and we say, there's nothing more that can be done, that we serve a God who has wonderful hands, <coughs> who will pick us up in the moments of our despair and might even push us a little bit in the moments of our complacency and apathy. Now, these are wonderful hands. These are the very hands that sculpted and molded the very universe in which we exist. Can we not exhibit enough faith to know that although our hands may be tired from a long day of work, although our hands may be wounded from those around us, <coughs> that we can trust those gentle, wonderful, inviting hands. You see, this is a vision that we must grasp. Recently, the leadership was forwarded an article by a man named Frank Powell. And the context of the article is addressing this very issue of attracting and keeping an upcoming generation. Sometimes they're referred to as the millennial generation. And the essence of the article is talking about how do we keep this generation interested and involved in the church. This 20-something year old age range. It's a problem within the church. There's no doubt about it. It is a significant problem. And it's not just here at Westridge. It's across the board in our society, in our culture. But there's one thing in this article that I thought was so important. You see, in this article, the author says, what is important to these upcoming generations is how a church responds to the loss in the world, both locally and globally. How a church responds to the poor, the homeless, the needy, and the widowed. If you want to ensure that your church has very few of this rising generation, spend most of your resource on your building and have a lot of programs that do little to impact anybody outside of the church walls. In essence, what this author is suggesting is, is that we have a generation that is no longer satisfied to merely think and consider but rather, we have a generation that wants to act and do. My friends, there's nothing new about what Frank Powell brings to the table. For this is the very commissioning in which we were given some 2,000 years ago. We are called to act. We are called to do. We are called to involve our hands in the lives of those around us. And yes, it will be uncomfortable at times. And yes, there are times in which your hands will be wounded and hurt. But the question that you must ask yourself is, is it worth it? Because think about the hands that rescued you, who brought you up out of the pit of your own sin. Those hands that rescued you whenever you needed rescuing the most. Was it worth it? And are you willing to be those hands to someone else 
Maybe the better question is this, brother and sister. Whom have these hands touched? How have they served? Where have they blessed? And maybe, just maybe, if you're having difficulty recalling whom they have served, whom they have blessed, what they have touched, maybe now this is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart saying, you've got work to do. So get to it. Because we've all got a way to participate in the building of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. But now our gaze falls from those hands. And we find ourselves looking at the precious feet of Christ. And as I look at the precious feet of Christ, I see that they were intentional. You see, I read the Gospels and I see that Jesus walked this earth with purpose and direction. I have yet to find the passage in which it says Jesus was bumbling about with nothing to do on one particular day. But rather that Jesus walked this earth with a single-mindedness about him. And what is that single-mindedness that he had? That he made it very clear to us. Glorify the Father. What is it that I have come to do, Jesus said? I have come to glorify the Father. And that is the very purpose and direction in which he conducted his entire life. Glorify the Father. Friends, what are we called to do? What is your purpose? What is your direction? Nothing's changed. It's all the same. Glorify the Father in all that you do. Amen. You want to know what your direction in life is? You want to know what your purpose in life is? I could write a book. It probably wouldn't be that big. It probably wouldn't sell very much. The purpose of your life is simple. Glorify the Father. Maybe some people would like to read that book. It would be a one-page book. <laughs> you see, for every Christian, we should have a desire. And that is to live actively and intentionally for Jesus. That's the purpose. It is to glorify the Father through our service in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does it mean to be intentional? It means to have purpose in doing what it is that we are committed to do. It means that we have specific goals in mind and a clear direction. It means that whenever we pray, we pray for specific people. It means that whenever we are called to act, we act with intentionality. And we don't live underneath this cloud or within this fog of ambiguity, but rather that we are intentional about what it is that we are seeking to do. It means that we are called to bless one another's lives and the lives of those that are not inside of our congregation. It means that we glorify the Father as Christ glorified the Father. Now I could go on, but maybe the better question to ask is simply this. Where have these feet taken you? On what errands of mercy have they traveled? And what rooms have they entered? And maybe, my friend, if you're having difficulty answering this question, the Holy Spirit is tugging at your very heart. And He's pushing you and He's saying, Get busy. There's work to be done. And I've called you to do it. So glorify the Father. Pastor Brian Stoffergen, and I probably slaughtered his last name, shared a letter that he received from a member of his church. And he was addressing this very issue about being the very hands and the feet of Christ. And so this one particular individual was beginning to experience the transformation that occurred in their life by having this understanding be a part of their daily experience. 
And so the letter begins by saying, Oh, I wish that it could be the way that it used to be. That I could ask the person next to me, How are you? And the person could answer, Oh, just fine. And then we'd both go home. Strangers who have known each other for 20 years. But now, and now I have to get involved. Now I have to suffer when this community suffers. Now I have to be more than a person coming to observe a service. That man last week, he told me that I would never know how much I touched his life. And all I did was smile and tell him that I understood what it was to be lonely. Oh Lord, be here beside me. You touch me, Lord, so that I can touch and be touched, so that I can be cared for and care for others, so that I can share my life with all of those that belong to you. The very thought of your touch, Lord, it's changing me. Are the hands and the feet changing you? Are they changing your experience? Have you allowed the hands of Christ to touch your heart? Are you willing to follow Him wherever it is that He may lead? As we are called to examine these hands, as we are called to look upon these feet, I'm reminded of the words of a woman that lived long ago. Teresa of Avila. And she famously said this, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion upon this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with he, which he blesses all the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, will you be the hands? Will you be the feet of Christ? Will you do as you are called to do? Will you pray with me? Lord God.